Well, today we are very honored and very blessed. How many of you guys remember Pastor Dan? All right, well then I guess we don't need to introduce you. Cindy, where's Cindy at? It's Cindy and Josh, and hopefully, there they are, wave up, there they are. Make sure you give them a big squeeze and hug on the way out as well. So will you please welcome Pastor Dan Munt. Thank you, Terry. Blessings. <laughs> I don't know that I'm real concerned about whether or not they remember me, Terry. I am a little concerned about whether or not you do. <laughs> well, what a joy it is to be here today. Uh, we, we pull into our, and by the way, Cindy and uh, Josh are right back here, and I've been looking for Becca to walk in, uh, and she is right over there. So because you're a little late, dear, you've got to stand up, and everybody's got to welcome you this morning. <laughs> she had good reason to be late. <clears throat> she hung out with a bunch of girls last night. So it really is a joy to be here. Uh, thank you, Pastor Terry, for this welcome today. And uh, honestly, I... I am not used to having this much time to preach. I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> so hurry up and open your Bible today. <laughs> When we uh, drove into the city the other day, we, we have a little thing that we've said for 19 years. In fact, uh, last uh, couple, two weeks ago would have been 19 years ago that we moved into the city. And um, one time we were coming home, I think from a long trip to, from Florida or something, and, and Becca, who was very small, said to us as we pulled into the city, she said, oh, thank you, Jesus, we're in our village. And so when we pulled in the other day, pulled on to 6th Street, Cindy said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. We're in our village. Uh, this will always be our village. This is like coming home for us. And um, I can honestly tell you, about, probably only about 20 times a day do I say, Why in the world did we move? Uh, but it's too late now. So. And, and then the kids beat me up a little bit and say, Why did we move, Dad? Uh, we're so connected to our village, and uh, again, when we walk into this place, this was uh, a point in our life as we pastored here for 16 years that uh, means so much. I was here a couple weeks ago just passing by, and I wanted to come and just uh, uh, kneel at the chair there where I used to uh, kneel and just pray. And um, God did some amazing things in our lives those 16 years we pastored here. And this place will always be such huge memories for us. And really, it's, it's not the memories of the building. Uh, I do remember one story, though, by the way. We were building that back door back there and, and found out that, that they, whoever built it, and it wasn't me, did it wrong. So Roger and I came in and said, we have got to tear that, that door right there out and rebuilt it again. Well, when, when you give Roger Vogel, Roger, just wave your hand there. Yeah. When you give him the task of tearing something out, He's a lot better at tearing it out than putting it back. He's pretty good at putting it back, too. So Roger's just going to town. He's going crazy and, you know, boards everywhere and nails everywhere. And he gets done and he jumps off the ladder like this. And he went, ah! I said, Roger, what's wrong? And he fell to the ground, put up his foot, and there was a two-by-four nailed to the bottom of his foot. <laughs> really, you're saying, ooh, but it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of us laughing, Roger said, oh, it hurts, and then he cracked up again. And So anyway, that's just a little story about the building, but uh, really, it's not buildings that create memories. It's people. It really is people. So uh, we have lots and lots of memories, and thank you for the invitation, and uh, Pastor Terry, whether you remember me next year or not, I sure would like to come back. So... Take your Bibles, if you will, or your iPad or your phone. Stand to your feet. Uh, I don't know. I didn't tell Valerie about this. I try to do this as much as I can on the road, and people look at me. But I'm going to keep doing this because I think it's powerful. Hold up your Bibles. Let's make our confession together. Is it back there, Valerie? We'll see if you remember it because I'm sure I don't. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. 
I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. I'd like for you to open your Bibles and continue to stand, if you will, to Romans, the 8th chapter. <clears throat> Romans, the 8th chapter. And I'd like for all of us to read it together. It's kind of a lengthy reading, so just kind of hang with it. Uh, but I want us to get this down deep in our spirit. So Romans, the 8th chapter, it's coming up on the screen. <clears throat> Let's read it together. One, two, three. And we know, pause for a second, because I want you to hear those three words. And we know. And we know. Say it. And we know, continue to read, that God causes everything. <clears throat> and are called according to his purpose. Going, going down to verse 31. And what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Next verses, I believe we go to verse 37. Read it together. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus. Father God, we thank you for your word today. God, and as we started out today just saying, and we know, God, I pray that this word this morning would get deep down into our knower, that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your word is true. God, that we would know that you're for us, not against us. God, that we would know that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to somebody and give them a high five. And you may be seated. <clears throat> I love what it says. In fact, the title of my message today is, I must know. I must know. Listen, church, in these days that we live, most people would agree that we're living in the last of the last days. And can I just say this to you? I'm not forecasting anything other than what the Bible says. But I believe that we are in a season that things are going to get much worse economically and nationally than they are going to get better. I just believe that. And as we walk through that season, in fact, most people believe that, as we walk through that season, there are things we must know. In fact, the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And sometimes I've quoted, the truth will set you free. We sing, the truth will set you free. But we leave out the first part. We must know the truth so that the truth, truth can set us free. I remember one time in Bible college, I, I really didn't have time to study, and I had a big test coming up, and I decided I was going to take my notes of my, uh, that I'd been studying and say, oh God, you know my heart. I did not have time to study for this test. Oh God, will you put the words of this test down deep in my heart? And will you bring it up when the question is asked? And I was a very young and immature believer. And guess what? The test results showed that God did not answer my prayer. <clears throat> because he knew that to answer that prayer, listen to this, would mean that I wouldn't get the stuff on the page that I needed so desperately down deep in my heart. Because I must know the truth so that the truth can set me free. I must know the truth. We must be people who go after truth. I talked to a, a pastor, and this pastor pastors an evangelical church. And uh, he happened to be under my care and my watch. And I said, I, I've heard of some doctrine you're, you're preaching, and I just want to confront you on it. I want to ask you, are you preaching this doctrine? And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I heard you say in your sermon, somebody got a hold of me and said, you said this, 
that Jesus is not the only way to heaven. He said, well, you've got to understand the context. I said, there is no context for that. That's false doctrine. That's a lie from the pit of hell. This man was a very honest man. He was one that wanted to impress the crowds with his knowledge, but he's no longer pastoring a church. <clears throat> because the truth sets us free. Lies put us in bondage. And this truth that we read about this morning is so important that we know. You know, I, I'm so impressed with Peyton Manning. I'm more impressed with him now that he's not a Colts fan, by the way, or now that he doesn't play for the Colts. In fact, Josh and I both were rooting for Peyton Manning the other day. We just grew up with a strong dislike for the Colts. Uh, but <laughs> And some of you are saying, you don't know the truth, buddy. But anyway, Peyton Manning was such a rhythmic quarterback. It was amazing that he knew exactly where the receivers were supposed to be. The important thing is that they knew it. And so in order to get there, they practice and practice and practice. Some people say that they ran some place 10,000 times. And I heard a football announcer say, in order to be great in football, you have to run your plays 10,000 times in order to be great. 10,000 times. Yet sometimes we're so simple with the word of God. Oh boy, I got my Bible lesson done for today. That was a hard one. Hope I don't have to see that one again. But we will know the truth. That means get it down deep in our knower. Let it transform our lives. And listen, uh, is, and by the way, Terry, uh, I didn't say this uh, to begin with because I really thought, for, first of all, you offended me by two things. You forgot me. And secondly, you haven't taken down the sign yet. The old is gone, the new has come. I'm not sure what he means by that. And by the way, you're not that much younger than I am old, if that makes sense. <clears throat> but uh, Terry and Jenny, I want to say thank you. Thank you for serving this church so well. <clears throat> I couldn't be more proud of the job you're doing. I tune in once in a while, whether you like it or not. And this is what I know about Pastor Terry. He's going to know the truth, and he's going to preach the tr truth. And he's not going to waver from the right or to the left. He's not partly because I'm going to beat him up if he does. <sighs> not really. But secondly, because I know his heart. He's going to stick to the stuff. It's the stuff of the truth. So thank you, Pastor Terry. Will you one more time say thank you to... By the way, also sitting down in the front row, Chad, uh, what's your last name, Chad? Chad Garrison. I, Chad's part of my team in the district. I hired him here, and uh, then he said, well, now that you're gone, let me move to Rochester. So I've been ticked off with him ever since. But uh, I'm telling you, you have a great gift in Chad. Thank you for coming, Chad, and I know you're serving alongside of Pastor Terry. <clears throat> And thank you to all the FOC staff and team for, I mean, I was here this morning, obviously, in worship and thought, wow, Jesus is still part of this place very strong. And his plans are unwavering. The DNA of this church is set, and God wants to reach a city. Amen? <clears throat> I said all that to say, well, I said all that mainly because I do appreciate, but secondly to say, you can hear the best sermons for, from Pastor Terry, and you will. You'll hear, hear some really good sermons, but it will never be enough for you to know the truth. It's kind of like having one good meal a week and deciding that you're going to live healthy. You can't do it with one good meal a week. You've got to get into the truth, and you've got to know the truth. And here's four things we must know. If you're taking notes, I supplied some in the bulletin. Uh, let's look at the first one first of all. Here's some things I must know. Here's four things I must know among a hundred things. I must know, I must know, all things work together for good. I must know that. Listen, the ingredients of your life are mixed up in a bowl called your life. And there's stuff in that bowl that I don't like about my life. But the ingredients have churned or have God has stirred, stirred, stirred them. God is still putting into my life the things that make me the man that he's called me to be. 
And even the points of pain in my life, even the points of failure in my life, it's still part of my life and I can't get it out of my life. But he's even taking those disappointing things. He's even taking those disappointing things and he's turning them around for good. Probably one of the hardest things I ever went through in my life was when my parents were divorced when I was nine years old. And trust me, I, I, when people talk about divorce, I'm telling you, I am, I am a guy that, that hates divorce because I know what it does to the kids. And, and the Munt children are still reeling now that I'm 41 years old. <laughs> We're still reeling over it. But I know this, even in the midst of that horrible occasion in my life where my dad abandoned us, and my mom was left with nothing. I know God has used that and brought some good. I was sitting, my dad is 80 years old now, and he and I text all the time, and, and uh, I was sitting in a hotel room preaching in Flint, Michigan the next morning, and I got into a texting conversation with my dad. And my dad said these words just months before. He said, will you forgive me? And I said, Dad, I forgive you already. Now, 50 or 40-some years after the event, said, will you forgive me? And in that hotel room, he's texting me and he said, I love you, son. And that was the first time I ever heard it out of his voice through a, a telephone. And I want to tell you something. Now my dad and I text just about every night. God has turned around a relationship. My mom turned 80 in June and my dad called my mom and said, Dolores, I just want to apologize for everything I did. Because sometimes the greatest story ever told are stories of incredible redemption and incredible forgiveness. Who of you out there has had to forgive someone? If you don't raise your hand, I want to tell you something. You will before long. Love requires it. Sometimes the hardest story or the story that God brings for good are the stories we don't like to talk about because of the incredible pain. I'm telling you, the Munt family is going through a real struggle today. Uh, and, and we talk about it almost every week, the struggle in our immediate home. But we constantly come back to this truth. And we know that all things work together for good. Had to remind myself that when Becca went to her first day of school and uh, came home and she had a big sticker on the side of her car said that she had parked illegally in the parking lot at school and pulled her down to the principal's office and the secretary said, you should have known not to park there. Well, when Cindy, Cindy is a very, very calm uh, poodle. But I'm telling you, sometimes she becomes a pit bull. And when Becca pulled in the driveway with this stupid stinking sticker on her car, she was ticked. And, and I'll just tell you right now, Cindy hardly ever gets ticked, but when she does get ticked, watch out. She called, and any of you would have, she called the guidance counselor and said, listen, this was my daughter's first day of school. How dare you do that to her? She had, you didn't tell her where to park. All of these things, and Becca said a week later, I feel invisible in this school that's three times as large as the school she was part of. And I went back to this verse in my heart, all things work together for good. God will find a way to work this out. All things work together for good. We have got to know that according to his purposes. I love uh, Philippians 2, 13, it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Check that out. God is working in me so that I will do his good pleasure. And before we take too much credit for always following the will of God, most of us really stink at it sometimes. But God is working in me. God is working in you. So that when response time comes, so when the test is due, he's worked in you so that you'll do his good pleasure instead of our flesh's good pleasure. Jesus prayed, not my will be done, I'm so glad when I read that verse because the reality, what that told me is Jesus really didn't want to do what he was supposed to do. And he prayed those words, not my will. My will is to not go to the cross, but yours be done. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? With fear and trembling, by the way. Not my will, but yours be done. By the way, 
to those who, the Bible says that all things work together, to those who are being praying, prayed for. You have a point to write that down there. Go ahead and bring that up, Valerie, if you will. According to his purpose. Go back. I, I just want you to see this. Becca, by the way, did this PowerPoint for me. Ready for this? Boom. Go ahead. Boom. Go ahead. Now pause after the pause. Now check this one out. Isn't that cool? <laughs> it's the little things in life. <laughs> According to his purpose, to those who are being prayed for. Well, what does that mean? Verse 27. Look at verse 27 if you have your Bibles open. It says, And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for the believers in harmony with God's will. The Spirit pleads for the believers. In other words, those, those groanings, those things that you can't interpret. Listen, the Spirit of God that lives inside of you is always talking to the Father on your behalf. He's interceding. Last Monday night, I, I woke up about 12.30 in the morning, very anguished, and couldn't sleep until about 5.30. And I didn't even really know how to pray, but I laid there in my bed for those five hours and just kind of almost groaned. I was restless. And the next morning, I realized that the Spirit of God inside of me was praying the perp perp perfect will of God. Praying the perfect will of God. The Holy Spirit was speaking through me to the Father because he knows the will of God. And in that event, I didn't know what to pray. But I do know the Holy Spirit knows what to pray. To those who are called, first of all, he called you to salvation. He called you to salvation. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? Raise your hand proudly, by the way. Raise your hand. Almost all of us in this place know Jesus as our Savior. Jesus called you there. You did not get to salvation by yourself. The only way you get to the Father is through Jesus Christ the Son. As he calls you, as he pleads with you, as he seeks you, as he searches after you. So you've been called into this great, great kingdom. And because of that, the Bible says that all things work together for you, for good for you. For you. Uh, it's interesting. I was thinking about this story and thinking about God kind of overlooking a big maze. Have you ever seen those before? You have a tower that sees the hole, the beginning from the end, and the tower, and you're in the middle of the maze trying to figure out, okay, what direction do I go? And the person that oversees the maze is calling out. He's calling you. He's calling you to say, turn right or turn left. And here's the point that we have to understand. There's been times in my life that he said, turn right, and I've said, I've liked it better left. And in the middle of that disappointment, I'm sure that Father God went through. And in the middle of the pain that I just turned into, we don't realize when we disobey, we open up our life to incredible pain. In the middle of that pain I just turned my life into, God already found a way out. And I'm sure at the end of the maze, God will say, you know when you turn left instead of right? That was not my will. And that's why you have this pain that you've dealt with for years sometimes. But I want to tell you something. I've worked it out for you. Because all things work together for good. The incredible lesson I learned from turning left instead of right is I'm not going to turn left anymore. It's amazing how God gets us out of stuff. I, I tell this story all the time. I was standing here, Cindy was standing here, and we were welcoming new members to the congregation, and Fred and Jane Allen were standing here, Jane's back here. and uh, You know, sometimes I, I guess I was probably known for saying really crazy things from the pulpit and not knowing it. Everybody's laughing, and I have no idea what. I never do that anymore. I'm very mature and very. <laughs> so in the middle of praying for them, Cindy and I standing here said, Lord, I pray, because they drove a, a considerable distance to come to church, I said, Lord, I pray that they'd have more gas when they got home than when they came. Now, it was an honest, honest prayer. The congregation were thinking wrong things. And all of a sudden, I heard, probably from Barry up here, the snickers start to come. And then several people. And I think we laughed for about five minutes straight. And every time I went to talk, I cracked up again. And in my heart of hearts, I'm saying, oh, God, how can you get me out of this? <laughs> I heard Fred say, we're going to the Baptist church. <laughs> 
But in the middle of our mistakes, in the middle of the times where we want to do our own thing, God says, listen, I have a perfect will for you. And I've called you to my will. Reminds me of the little girl who kept on going over the boundaries with her trike and kept on, kept on, you know, her mom said, don't cross this boundary. If you cross this boundary, I'm going to spank you. And she just kept on doing it. So her mom had had it. She came out to the little girl and said, honey, you keep crossing this boundary. I'm going to give you one more chance. And if you cross this boundary again, I'm going to spank you. And she looked at her mom and said, spank me now because I have places to go and people to see. I wonder how many times we ridiculously say that to the Lord. Well, I want to go this way no matter what the pain. I want to go this way no matter what the pain. I'm sure glad that he also said that I'll work this out. If you keep your affection on me, the next point is this. Again, just say ah when that comes up. Ready? Ah. Love God. God has called us to love him. And the greatest illustration I can tell you, when Cindy and I got married, now over 30 years ago, I forsook all other girls that were chasing me. <laughs> With my hair parted down the middle of my silk shirt. <laughs> of course, she's really laughing. She knew no one was chasing me. <clears throat> But I forsook all other girls and said, Cindy, you will be my bride forever. And for these 30 years, I've still said, you are the only one. You're the only one. And that's what it means to love someone. It means I'm committed to you. I have chosen you. And you're in this place mostly because you have chosen the Lord. And mostly you've chosen the Lord because he first of all chose you. And he said, if you gear your heart to love me, the Bible says that we're to love, we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all our soul, and all of our mind. When you set my heart to, your heart to love me, even when you make mistakes, I'm going to make all things work together for good. And by the way, another point is this, because we are being transformed into his image. He'll make all things work together. But listen, there's a bigger plan for your life than usually we recognize. Here it is. If you want to know the plan for your life, well, I'm planning to be a preacher. That's probably not the only plan God has for your life. Well, I'm, pro I'm planning to be a great mom. That's admirable, and you should. But the overriding element of call in your life is this. If you're a believer... If you know Jesus as your Savior, his call and his will over your life is that you be transformed into his image. And it's a lifelong journey. God's will for us is that we continue to look and act like Jesus. Is that we continue. Look at verse 29, if you will. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Listen to it. For God knew his people in advance. Before he knew Dan Munt, before I was ever born, before I was born, I should say, he knew me. He knew all the events of my life. And by the way, didn't always rescue me from them. Someone said the other day, God didn't free you from your struggle. He freed you so you can struggle with purpose. That's huge. In all the events of my life, he knew it. Now, 51 years later, he knew this day when I would go through that. He knew that day when I would go through that. He knew the day last Wednesday when a pastor calls me up crying and says, my brother just hung himself last night. And the events of my life helped me come to a place where I could act like Jesus with him and weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. He knew all the events of my life, and he said, in all these things, I'm going to work them for good, but you need to understand, in verse 29, that the good may not look like the good you want, because the ultimate good is not that you have pleasure, but that you look more like Jesus. That's the ultimate good. And by the way, someone say, well, what do I need to do to look like Jesus? Well, we must know the truth, and the truth will set us free from ourselves. But how does Jesus look? Here's what he looks like. Ready for this? 
He looks like love. He looks like love. We were at a wedding last night, a beautiful wedding, and of course, in those weddings, sometimes they, they bang, bang the cup like this, you know, and that means they're supposed to kiss. They didn't do that at my wedding, and I'm really ticked off at it. Well, Cindy and I were reminded of a wedding that you could not do that. It was a rule you couldn't do that. If you wanted them to kiss, you had to stand up and sing some song with love in it. And so my wife said, I'm going to stand up and sing, what's love got to do with it? (laughs) If you want to look like Jesus, you're going to have to learn to love. You're going to have to learn to love. And that means forgiveness. That means unconditional love. By the way, the greatest way for those of you who are married, the greatest way God has planned for you to look more like him is he gave you the spouse he gave you. So if you're married, go ahead and turn to her or him and just kind of go like this. Listen, men, God loved your wife so much that she sent you to work during the day so you wouldn't have to put up with him or sent you to work during the day. <laughs> Listen, being married isn't easy, other than my, my marriage, of course. Extremely easy. But what God is training Cindy how to do is love the unlovable. (laughs) And sometimes what, listen, all of us say, "Ah, Jesus forgave me for so much, so I'm going to forgive. But love means that you'd forgive the stuff you never thought you'd have to. That's what it means. It's what Jesus did. Joy. Joy. To have this deep residing joy. To have peace, that's what, who Jesus is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, goodness. That's who Jesus is. As I read that list, anybody have anything to work on? Anybody married to somebody that has something to work on? And by the way, the greatest way to stop the work of, of becoming more like Jesus in your life, here's the greatest way, is to choose to be offended. Choose to be offended. I had a congregational meeting the other day that uh, I think I can say there's, there's very little children in here, and I think you'll understand the heart of what I'm about to say. I called it the congregational meeting from hell. <laughs> it was one of those. I mean, I was getting screamed at from over here. Somebody else over here was, in fact, uh, I went to preach to that congregation last week, and the whole time I was preaching, one lady was going like this, looking at me. That's what she was doing. <laughs> But what I learned about that congregation is they had been offended for over 20 years. And because they, they didn't know, and their pastor was offended, by the way. And because they didn't know how to handle offense, check this out, they were very immature in the way they fought. I don't mind a good fight. I don't mind a good argument. Those are healthy at times. But knowing how to have those good arguments is the difference between being like Jesus and being like yourself. Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. By the way, point number two, the rest of these won't last as long, although I do have a lot of time to preach. (laughs) Point number two, I must know, I have got to know this, that God is for me, not against me. Listen, when you have the funeral of your daughter, as Ramona did this week, you've got to know God is for you, not against you. Marty Lawler, I woke up early Friday morning with just her on, our, on my heart. She's in the battle of her life. And she and her family has got to know, God is for me, not against me. God is for me, not against me. And when the enemy brings up these, these attempts to derail you and keep you in guilt and condemnation, listen, our God is for us, not against us. We sang it. Our God is for us, not against us. He hasn't changed our mind. Is he disappointed with us at times? Excuse me. It's the right cup, right, Joe? You didn't drink out of this one? Good. He's disappointed with us at times, and sometimes in my sin and failure and confusion and worry, I forget that God is for me, not against me. And we got to know that, church. we got to know it, because it will set you free in the greatest attack from hell. You've got to know that God is for you, 
not against you. I love Jeremiah 29, 11. Most of you could probably quote this verse. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good. They are plans for good and not for disaster. They are plans to give you a future and a hope. <clears throat> I, again, I, I don't want to share too much of personal stuff because I, I don't want anything to ever just look like it's about us. But in the middle of our moving, I want to tell you something. It's been an incredible painful time. It's been an incredible painful time. And, and there are times that the Lord and I have had an argument. And here's what the argument has been. Lord, I screwed up my family. Last February, I was so depressed with that thought in my mind. I messed up my family. I messed them up. To uproot them in the middle of their junior year, in the middle of a young adult life, the only life they ever knew was here, and to take that plant and pull it up. I said, Lord, I messed up my family. And I went back again. I know that all things work together for good. I know that God has plans and they're for good and not for disaster. Therefore a future and therefore a hope. In the middle of our, our lives at times where it looks so painful and so hopeless, I want to tell you something. When I hear the word cancer, this is what the enemy tries to do in me. He tries to say hopelessness. Without hope, without hope, without hope. I know the plans I have for you. There are plans to give you a future. And their plans to give you a hope. We have got to know that God is for us, not against us. Point number three. I must know. I must know this. I am more than victorious. Yet in all these things, Paul said, all of these things. In fact, Romans, the eighth chapter, probably would be, uh, if, if you could set a week aside just to memorize the eighth chapter. Now, I need to tell you, it's 39 verses. It's pretty, pretty big. But if you can get Romans, the eighth chapter, down in your heart, if you can get it down there, listen, it will transform your life. Romans, the eighth chapter, is one of the most powerful chapters in the whole Bible. Yet in all these things, you are more than conquerors through him who loved you. More than, if you look at the Greek, it, it talks about super abundance in victory. Super abundance in victory. Uh, I, I used to share this uh, every Easter Sunday morning, and I haven't preached in on Easter for about four years now, and really, I mean, this is one of my sad points of life. I love to preach on Easter, but I shared this, test, this uh, illustration, and, you know, I know Pastor Terry probably already forgot it, but the rest of you will remember it. And uh, so indulge me if, uh, if you remember it, but I love this illustration. Back in the days we used to get paychecks, we don't get a paycheck anymore. They don't pay us, no. <laughs> it's electronically transferred. But back in the days we get our paycheck, Brenda, Brenda would write out those checks and we'd sign them. And on Friday afternoon, I'd walk home after a long week's work. And with paycheck in hand, I'd say, honey, I'm home. And my bride turns the corner, my cat Zoe wiggling to me. My kids are saying, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. This is not true, by the way. <laughs> and my wife comes running to the arms of her love, I thought. And at the last minute, she seems to get sidetracked with something that it would appear is more important than hugging her husband. It was the paycheck. She comes up, honey. You're home, and I'm glad you worked so hard this week. Thank you. You see, I conquered the week. I worked hard and got paid, but my wife was more than a conqueror. She got the check. And by the way, ladies, I want to say this, but, but please understand what I'm about to say. She got the, she got the paycheck. And she didn't do anything for it. <laughs> now, we know that's not true. Now, we know that's not true. <laughs> Anybody have a basement I can live in? <laughs> what I mean by that, <laughs> now that I need to dig myself up, kind of like more gas when you uh, get home than when you came, what I mean by that is, listen, 
I did. <laughs> Some people are out there going like this. <laughs> What I mean by that is he did the work. He paid the price. He delivered the paycheck. I picked up the paycheck, having done anything but come to Jesus and said, help. And he gave me the victory. Am I better in better place? Honey, am I okay? No comments. <laughs> I am more, we have got to know that you are more than conquer. And the last one is, I must know, worship team, if you could come, please. <clears throat> I must know, I have got to know this, that nothing, nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Everybody just kind of look back this way. I know it's my fault for pulling them up. I've got to know, I've got to know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Got to know that. That God will never stop loving me. God will never give up for a moment. He'll never relinquish his love for me. He'll never say, I'm done. You've disappointed me too much. He'll never say that. He'll never. In fact, if you look at verse 35, it says, not anything, not anything, not death, not anything can separate you from the love of Christ. Ronan, when Melissa went home to be with Jesus this week, she was separated from us, but not from the love of Christ. Not from the love of Christ. Paul says these words, I'm crushed, but I'm not destroyed because nothing can separate me. Listen, church, in the middle of the hardest situation you'll ever go to, in the middle of abandonment and rejection, which I believe, by the way, is the hardest thing for a human being to overcome, abandonment and rejection. In the middle of all that, when everyone else would turn their back on you, Jesus will never turn his back on you. Jesus will never turn his back on you. He never will. Never will. When we were going through that very difficult time with my dad, nine years old, a couple of things that I remembered about my mom, my mom now 80, as I said, and, and really failing in her health, pretty bent over and rushed to the hospital the other day. She, had a, she fell and had a gush in her head down to her skull, and we had to now keep her from cooking and walking. She's got to be in a wheelchair all the time, so it's very difficult. But I remember my mom. She would gather, I was nine years old, she would gather myself, my brother who was 11, my sister who was four. And every night before we'd go to bed, she'd gather us around her bed. And she'd pull the money because we had nothing. She didn't even have her driver's license. We had nothing. And she would lift up in between her bed and her, and her box spring. She would grab her envelope of money and she'd put it on the bed. She said, let's pray over our money. So we'd pray over our money. By the way, it's one of the reasons we pray over our offering. Because it's something God did in my life when I was nine years old. And then she'd say, now, I want you to focus because I want to teach you something. In the middle of all this, I want you to know. I, you got to know this, kids. And we know that all things work together for good. I know we want Daddy to come home. But we know God's going to bring some good out of this somewhere. And all these things... We must know that in all these things, God works them out for our benefit. His love never fails. We are more than victorious. We are more than called and more than conquered. In fact, as I was studying this sermon last Monday, this song came on the radio and both on my way to the office and on my way home, it was the first thing I heard. And I don't even know what the name of the song is, but here's the words of the song Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trial and the change, one thing remains. And on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never, never have to be afraid because one thing remains. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails never gives up, 
never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. In death and life, I'm confident and covered by the power of his great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, never gives up, and never runs out on me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your abiding love. God, I thank you that just like victory you've given us, we didn't do anything to earn it. God, we didn't choose you. You chose us, and you sought us, and then you bought us with your great love. And God, that never stops. We never mature out of being sought by you. So, Lord, I pray that for this great congregation, as they move into these days to come, I pray that they would know all things work together for good. God, I pray that they would know if God is for them, then who could be against them? I pray that they would know that we are more than victorious. I pray that they would know that God, nothing can separate them from the love of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we close our eyes, continue to close our eyes, anyone in here would just say, Pastor Dan, I've never received Jesus as my Savior. And today I've heard about the story of his great love. And this morning I want to lift my hand and say, I want this Jesus you're talking about. Anybody at all? I want this Jesus you're talking about. Secondly, if you're here today and you would say, Pastor Dan, thank you for that word God spoke to my heart. Just lift your hand. Father God, I thank you for these hands, and I pray, Lord God, as we engage our future, God, as we overcome our past, God, that these things will remain. Your love never fails, never gives up. It never runs out on me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Love each of you very much. God bless you.